And that's my problem with the VA. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Stenzo, and I was in the United States Marine Corps Reserves from 99 to 2005. I was with 4th Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. I did one tour in Iraq in March 2003 and ended in September of 2003. I was activated four year. And I also did in the reserves what we call active duty special work. So I've essentially done two years worth of active duty with the United States Marine Corps Reserves. And um, while I was in country, within the final three weeks of tour in country, I had a non-combat injury and I was told by our battalion aid station officers that if I tell anyone that I had my back injury in country, that I would stay in country or I'd go to Germany, which would be in my best, best interest to not say anything until we get back to Camp Pendleton. So I thought that that was guidance from people who know what they're doing, so I figured that that would be the best thing to do. So I waited, injured, without my command even knowing that I was injured, and not even my platoon sergeant at the time, and I was a Lance Corporal when I was out there, that uh, I had a back injury. And again, you know, this is about trusting the guidance that I received from people who knew what they were doing. So I went back to Camp Pendleton and uh, immediately sought care with the Navy Medical Center. And I would, their, their response was actually outstanding. It was the day that I reported my back injury that it was the next day that I was actually seen. And I was getting therapy and I thought that this was great. I served my country and I did my tour in Iraq and I'm being taken care of. So I then got out of the military and became a full-time student and um, enrolled in Los Angeles, oh, it was Long Beach VA healthcare system. And that's where uh, I began to see the realities of what it truly means to be in the VA healthcare system. And I did leave the military with $17,000 saved, good credit, I was a good Marine, and I served honorably. I never questioned anything about the integrity of my service, my service to country, and the services that I was receiving until I wa went into the VA healthcare system. And it was then that some things were just not working out for me. So the $17,000 that I saved went to zero, expenses built to such an extent that they were overwhelming and I couldn't pay it anymore. So I ended up sleeping in my car for one day. I was in Hollywood, there was a food wagon that was serving free food to homeless people. And I, decided to take that opportunity to eat some free food. And I, at, at first I was thinking, I'm just hungry and this is free food and I'm gonna go for it. So I looked at myself and I started thinking to myself that I'm now an Iraq war vet. I'm standing in a line of, with homeless people being served free food and this is actually happening to me. This is actually happening to our Iraq era war vets and that I'm one of them and I'm a casualty of that system. And at that moment in time, the reality hit and it hit so hard that suicidal thoughts began. I broke down several times. I uh, literally cracked uh, the day after that. I lost dignity, self-respect. My honor just went down and I was in a very dark place for a considerable amount of time. They still want me to fill out more paperwork. They want me to do appointments again. And they want me to start from square one. It's been since 2005 that I got out. Um, they're requesting that I fill more paperwork. So that's where I stand to this day. My name is Adrienne Kinney. I served on active duty in the United States Army from 1994 to 1998 as an Arabic linguist and military intelligence. Um, I then transferred to the United States Army Reserves where I served from 1998 to 2004. I was activated and stationed stateside um, right after 9-11 for about two years. And having gone through this system, 
twice, once before 9-11 and the start of the wars and once after, I personally witnessed a complete transformation in the way the process was handled. When I graduated, um, I eventually got a job at the VA in Richmond, Virginia. And there I was working as a research assistant on a study looking at post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. And I was actually on a conference call when somebody said, wait a second, we can't start this screening process. Do you know that if we start screening for traumatic brain injury, there will be tens of thousands of soldiers who will screen positive, and we do not have the resources available that would allow us to take care of these people. So we cannot do the screening. And their rationale was that medically, medical ethics say that if you know somebody has a problem, you have to treat them. So since they didn't have the resources to treat them, they didn't want to know about the problem. The VA needs to address the fact that we have hundreds of thousands of veterans, new veterans, entering a system that has not grown to meet the demands that are being faced by fighting these two occupations. No veteran should have to go without. And not only that, no American should have to go out without health care. I personally believe that the best preventative health care, and this is a day and age where we're all about preventative health care, for our soldiers in uniform is to not use them to fight illegal occupations in the first place. But so long as our government is going to force our soldiers to continue fighting and serving in these occupations, I would call upon all members and employees, workers at the VA to remember our pledge to serve and provide for our returning veterans. And I think that it's so important for them to realize that they do not lose their right of freedom of speech just because they're a federal employee. It is just incumbent upon all VA employees to continue fighting and to fight vocally and long and hard until we have all the resources necessary to take care of our veterans. My name is Sergeant Christopher Sean Goldsmith. I'm from Belmore, a town in Long Island, New York, 20 minutes out of Manhattan. I could see the smoke when the towers fell on September 11th. I joined the Army to kill people. I signed up as a forward observer. My job was to go out and basically annihilate the enemy when we received contact. I was 19 years old when I was deployed to Iraq. And I spent the first eight months in Sadr City. The people there hate us. And the reason why is because when we went there, we promised them freedom and we promised them help. We promised to get them clean water, to get them food, to get them jobs. But all that I saw over there now, uh, all that I saw over there in 2005 and all that there is now is two to four uh, hours of electricity a day, sewage that leaks into their fresh water system, if you want to call it fresh. The water treatment plant, which hasn't been finished, it was barely even worked on the entire year that I was set in Iraq. When I came home from Iraq, all I did was drink. I, I'm a severe alcoholic, and so was just about everybody who lived in the barracks with me. We used to go out every Friday, Saturday night, and I would have a 1.75 liter bottle of vodka, and I'd just about finish it. And I blacked out every time. That was my goal. I wanted to black out. I, I was self-medicating. Because we were told that if we were to seek mental health, we would be locked away. And that our careers would not advance. If I admitted that I had severe chronic depression, if I thought I had PTSD or anything like that, my career could have been ruined. The only thing that I had to look forward to was getting out of the military and going to college. I had learned my lesson the hard way, 
that I should have gone to college, should have got an education, and should never have seen the ugly face of war. And that hope was taken away from me on January 10th, 2000, 2007, when George Bush stood in front of Congress and gave his State of the Union address where he announced that he was going to send an additional 20 to 30,000 troops into the sandbox. And my unit was the fifth brigade of the five to be locked down with stop loss. No one could leave to re-enlist, to go somewhere else to avoid the deployment. No one could escape the military. People who were ready to retire, set to retire two months from then, were locked into an 18-month deployment under some of the worst conditions since the initial invasion. Those 20 to 30,000 troops that Bush sent over didn't have homes waiting for them. They slept in the dirt. They slept in metal connexes. They slept in houses that had been abandoned. They slept in what they called Al-Qaeda training camps, which is something I want to mention. When I was over there in 2005, I didn't see Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda wasn't there. I was set to deploy the same week that I was set to get out of the Army according to my contract, and that was in May of 2007. The day before I deployed, was supposed to deploy, Memorial Day, I went out onto a field in Fort Stewart where there's a memoriam, a tree planted for every soldier in the 3rd Infantry Division who has died. I went out among those fallen soldiers and I tried to take my own life. I took pills and I went back to my regular poison of vodka and drank until I couldn't drink anymore. The next thing that I knew, I was handcuffed to a gurney in the hospital. They tried to prosecute me for malingering. I should have the stripes stripped, they should take money from me, possibly put me in jail. And when I went to legal counsel, the, the military lawyers on Fort Stewart, and I asked for help to fight this Article 15 non-judicial punishment from my commander, they said, no, you need to give up this fight because people try to fight it and all it does is bring down the military and blah, blah, blah. And I was refused help. I was eventually removed from the military on one of the happiest days of my life, August 16th of 2007, on a general discharge. My DD-214, the paperwork which states my entire, every accomplishment of my military service, says in nice, big, bold letters, misconduct serious offense. I committed a serious offense by trying to kill myself because I was so damaged by the, war, the occupation in Iraq. So I lost my college benefits. My money is, is disappearing between VA visits and personal instability. I've found, found it extremely hard to find a job. So I deliver pizzas on Wednesdays. That's what I am now, a pizza delivery boy. I was a sergeant, I was a leader, I was a trainer. I was very well thought of. I was one of the most professional soldiers that I ever met. And I, I mean, I got the paperwork right here in front of me if anyone ever wants to see it. I was a very good soldier. But now I'm pizza delivery boy who works once a week because that's the only job where I can call in a couple hours before and say, I'm still at the VA. I'm waiting in line. I'm sorry, I can't come in for a couple hours. Major Wesner, Captain Mello, Lieutenant Colonel Agi, First Sergeant Titu, and Sergeant Major Altman, I have one message for you. And that is something that is internationally understood across the world. And that's this. Peace. You're free, and freedom is beautiful. And, uh, you know, it'll take time to restore chaos and order, but we, but we will. Gritty, sweet trigger, all out war, simplify, fight or die, give my life for the core. Situation is raw, shell cases raining down, fighting off insurgents in the north Iraqi town. Back to back, huddle down, struggling for cover, a mission not worth winning, but we fight to save each other. They betrayed our band of brothers, this is just here to die.
And hit me loud, I deal that their policies deny We fighting for a lie, a dust fills my eyes My throat is so dry, my ears are full of cries The wounded and the dying, screaming agony In English or in Arabic, it's all the same to me We're here to make them free, to spread democracy But the smell of rotten bodies stinks of hypocrisy It's finally so clear to me, I'm never coming home Books will use our bones to build this new throne You got your war, what's it doing for me? You got your war, tell me who's getting free You got your war What's your justification? You ain't building a nation, just inflaming the hatred. You got your war. It's a pack of 